Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Gustavo Arellano, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. I <laughs> cut off your Spanish part. Anyway, I love it. I love having you on. Thanks for being on the show. I appreciate you doing this with me. I, I definitely enjoy your newsletter. Everybody should check out uh, Gustavo's uh, at website. It's right there on the page. GustavoArellano.org is where it's going to be at. This great newsletter in there. And in general, also his book, Taco USA, How Mexican Food Conquered America. You've, uh, you've been commenting on culture. Mexican culture, Southern, Southern California culture for decades now. <laughs> Did you see this path for you? No, of course not. Uh, t- 20 years, I guess that constitutes now decades, right? Because yeah. it's a multitude. That's funny. I've been writing since 1547, man. Um, no, I was never meant to be a reporter. I just fell into this by accident. I don't suffer from imposter syndrome. I think I enjoy what I do, but sometimes I do think like, damn, like, I've done a lot of stories and I still have a lot of stories in me. So just got to do if if you hit a groove, you just got to get that groove on until either it's no longer there, then move on to something else or until you just don't like it anymore and then move elsewhere. Yeah. A pastor taught me a long time ago. He said, uh, you know, you can be in a roof or you can be in a, a groove or a rut. You know, you just gotta, just <laughs> that's, that's a great way of putting it for sure. Yeah. 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 How do you know if you're in a rut? When you don't like it anymore. Uh, I, people always ask me, how do you, how are you able to do so much? How are you able to host a daily podcast and do a column for the LA times and do a newsletter and come out on this show and that show and teach at orange coast college and help out your wife at her, uh, restaurant and market and all of these things. And I tell them it's simple. I like it all. I love it all. Frankly, it's fun. If there was any part of those things that were not fun, I wouldn't do it. And I'm lucky enough to be able to be at a position in my career where I could get to choose what I want to do and what I don't want to do. And I understand not everyone's like that, but Hey, if I'm going to have that luxury, I'm going to, I'm going to take it. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. And you're right. I do similar things. Like how do I get in the car and drive to Texas to go talk to people? It's wonderful. It's, it's great. Fun. Yeah. I've got yes. it. Uh, where in Texas would you go? Uh, where, wherever I think the story was, <laughs> I drove, I drove all the way down to Del Rio. I don't oh, like yeah. Well, you know, if the vice president will go, I will, you know, and yeah. that's not a political statement. It's like, this isn't that hard to do. And it's a drive. Know, it's, it's fun. Insane. That's what, uh, how, how far is it from more from Southern California uh, to Del Rio? I've never been down there driving. It's, uh, it's not close to anything. So <laughs> El Paso was a good solid day. 12 hours. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. And then you go another, let's say five and a half, six hours, let's say six hours because you've got to kind of drive roundabout. Yeah. So it's not bad, but it is not close to anything. It's hours away from San Antonio. And hours and hours away from anything else that's big. Yeah, that's cool, man. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, like, look, you don't blink at all at going, you know, taking a 17 hour drive to go find a story. Other people, they don't want to go farther than two hours. So it's all for me, honestly, it's about, it's not even about perspective because perspective then makes it an objective thing. No, this is completely subjective. If you enjoy what you do, it's never going to be work. It's never going to be a hassle. Is it going to be hard sometimes? Of course, but sometimes people just like that challenge of just, putting themselves out there in places where they don't feel comfortable or in places where they're just uh, thrown in blind and have to fight their way out to get to some semblance of understanding. You write often about very specific, small things. uh, (laughs) Waraches. My sister wrote about it, not me. Well, that's true. Yeah, you're right. But it it was in your newsletter, right? So it's it's representative of what you do. But these things come out and you wrote about uh, quesadillas and you're tied to family and everything. How do you, it's so small, these topics, how do you suss out? Like you must just be pinging all the time. I want to write about this. I want to write about that. You know, I want all these different things. How do you sort out what's worthy of your time to bang out an article? As a reporter, I think the best reporters are always on. Even if you're not writing, you're looking at the world and saying, oh, that's a story. Oh, that's a story. You're also learning. You're reading all the time. As you go around, you keep things in your mind, in your in your back pocket, to use that cliche. And then when there's an opportunity to write about something or like if you have nothing else to write about, you just get into it. But 
I, I teach uh, journalism at Orange Coast College in Costa Mesa here in Orange County. And what and this is and you know the lessons that I teach my students are nothing are stuff that I've learned. And one of the things I always try to tell folks is that the best way to tell a story is like you reduce it to one thing, one person, one city, a food stuff, an item of clothing, a footwear, whatever. And then you're able to weave all of this in. So it's different when it's my column. When it's my column, it's a little bit, I don't want to say harder, but I have to think of a broader audience there. And I have an editor who I have to, you know, write story. You know, my, my mandate there is to tell stories about who we were, who we are, and who we're becoming as Californians. Mm-hmm. When it's my newsletter, it's me. And I have a general, I have a list of things that I want to get to as, as, uh, as email subjects. But honestly, I never write my newsletter until Friday afternoon and really Friday evening because I want it to read like just something that's off the cuff because it literally is just like, okay, get in there, type it out. It's not going to be the like uh, with a column. I'm far more deliberate. And so some things like, yeah, you you mentioned a, a, a column about quesadillas or a newsletter about quesadillas. So I love quesadillas. You know, I love che- I love cheese period. Pizza is also just like, oh my God, so good. And so my and so the 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 point of the or you know, when I wrote the newsletter that particular uh week, I talked about how this happened actually over the summer, how because I always visit my parents' house. Uh, my mom passed away a couple of years ago, so I definitely visit more than I used to just to be with my dad and my siblings. And my entire life, I've always had that that house, quesadillas, cheese, tortillas. Tapatio and also oranges. Oranges is very key. So one day I show up and none of it's there. Not oranges, not cheese. There was tortillas, but like there was no cheese. And it just made me feel forgotten. And it made me feel very sad in a way that I haven't felt sad in a long time. And I didn't hold it against my siblings. I wasn't angry at them or anyone, but it's just like, wow, they know that I love tortillas, but I slipped their minds. And so from there, I took that incident just to talk about what happens. You know, I think as humans, we want to leave our mark on this world one way or another. We don't want to be forgotten. Well, you know, I, I, I was trying to remember this earlier, but, you know, attribute it to whatever culture you want. I've heard it supposedly from Aztec culture, but I'm sure Jews believe this or whatever. But it's like that people suffer three deaths when you are buried on the ground. And then I forgot the middle one. But then the last one is when people say, uh, your name for the final time and then and after that. And yeah, uh, w- the, the human condition is we don't want to be forgotten. And in this case with the quesadilla, I was forgotten. Yeah, yeah. And it's powerful. There's these other messages that you put in there. When you look around, I mean, Southern California, we're, we're so multicultural. Sometimes we lose track of the fact that we're doing something that we've uh, brought into our lives. You know, like tacos are ubiquitous. I mean, you uh-huh. can go to Korea to kind of get tacos, right? I mean, it's just like it's everywhere. When how do you illustrate that to show the best of who we are? Because we do, we do do this stuff pretty well. Yes, we have flaws, but there's so much of this that we get right. And we accept, I've got a, I've got a blanket back there that I bought <laughs> on in, in a Baja. Right. So how do we, how do you tell us the best of who we are? Cause there's plenty of bad. Yeah. I mean, I tell about the bad as well as a columnist. I've ne- I've never been a feel good type of columnist. Uh, I just go tell stories. Sometimes they're going to be positive. Sometimes they're going to be negative. Sometimes they're going to be funny. Sometimes they're a combination of all three. But I, I, well, when it comes to food, I'd rather tell you where to go eat than where not to go eat. I could tell you where to not to go eat, but I'd rather tell you the good spots. So that's, you know, that's with food. But I just, especially as a columnist, I just look for stories that I think are in the zeitgeist, to use that cliche mm-hmm. of a word, but like something that's out in the, like either, Local news, hard news, or getting us up, whatever's on, on, you know, on everyone's mind and taking a completely different angle to it. And then after that, you just go out and find stories. So, for instance, over the summer, I did a story about these community cookouts that were happening in Los Angeles, in Mid-City, which is near Koreatown, basically where Koreatown turns into, starts turning into the west side, like right, literally Mid-City. And so it's these... Uh, immigrants from the Mexican state of Oaxaca, which is in Southern Mexico. Most of them are indigenous. So the Spanish isn't even their first language. And so I talked about how once a month outside this flower shop in mid city, uh, that's a rotating cast of street vendors who make their food from Oaxaca and they give it out to free. I mean, you can leave a donation if you want, but no one's going to be turned away. And the whole concept, it's not charity. This is not like the soup kitchen or anything like that. This is more like, okay, this is what we're doing. We're, uh, you know, we're going to do this fundraiser. We're going to pay these uh, local uh, local cooks. 
they're getting their um, their material, their food, their uh, their ingredients from Oaxaca. They're employing farmers down there so they could stay down there. They could create local economies. And the concept is called Gelaguetza. Gelaguetza, I forget, I forget what, what's the exact meaning in the Zapoteco language, which is one of the indigenous languages there. But a story like this, it involves food. It involves self-reliance. It involves community. It just happens to be about Latinos. It happens to be about Mexicans. That's almost besides the point, obviously, with the cuisine there. But that story got a really great reaction because people are like, oh, wow, you mean I could go get a chile relleno taco for free? Cool. So they go down there and then they see like, oh, shoot, like people are like trying to create local economies and trying to help folks out. This is, you know, in the summer. So the pandemic was starting to get into another uh, wave there. So stories like that to me are like, I, I live for those stories. Another great example about that. I did a story about, um, and I, I'm giving just food stories, but hey, food's always, no, no actually, I'll, I'll give a non-food story, even though I'm a food story. So earlier this year, I did a story about a gentleman, a Muslim man who died of COVID, but he was not just any regular Muslim. This is a man who was basically buried almost every dead Muslim man in Orange County and in Riverside County over the past 25 years. So, you know, in, in, in Islamic uh, funeral traditions, you have to uh, uh, bathe the body, you have to repair it a certain way. So this is the man who over the past 25 years did a bunch of these because everyone knew, this is a man who knew all the different uh, regionalities of Islam, knew how to do it, was very respectful, taught the women because men can only uh, bathe men and women can only bathe women. So taught women how to do it, you know, using like a mannequin or whatnot. So it was completely influential. And then, of course, with COVID, the, Islam, the Muslim community was just getting devastated by it. And then he eventually died of COVID. I mean, I, I talked to his children who live in Riverside. Two of them are police officers with LAPD. This is all American family. It just happened to be Muslim. And they said, yeah, he just passed away because he was just working so much. He literally died. And this is, and I also love these stories, like these micro communities here in Southern California. And I only write about uh, California, mostly Southern California for the LA Times. But these micro communities were still part of, they're our neighbors. They're who we are. So we could all relate to that. And we got such an outpouring of like, thank you for telling this story, not just from Muslims, of course, but like from everyone. So stories like that, like those are the ones that are fav my favorite. But like, if I have to talk bad things about bad people, then I'll do that as well. I used to do it more. I kind of miss it, but. I'll get, I'm, I'm slowly getting back there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yesterday, look, I, I fancy myself a bit of a writer. I'm not a pro like you, but I try to write things that come up at part in part to practice the art, but also just to tell some of these stories that I come across. And I, I have a, a great aunt that passed away suddenly, just dropped out at 15 mm -hmm. years old. And so we, we were talking about genealogy and a thread that I'm in. And so I thought, oh, I'm going to write this story. And the next thing you know, I'm back like all the way to 1823 at the beginning of this story to tell this incredible thing. And, and it's just a little hunk of an all American family that, you know, they came from somewhere else. They moved somewhere here. Then they moved somewhere else. And then they ended up, you know, and uh, especially when we write about things from a hundred years ago, people just died all the time. Like we're so, We've been hammered by COVID, but we're so fortunate in that people oh, can yeah. reliably predict to live 70 years. You know, like that would be a decent life. Yeah. No, look, we, we, despite all the troubles that are out there, we're probably at the best point ever in human history. If you really want to get down to it, I'm, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist. You have to be an optimist. You have to think that things are going to get better when you do tell people that, yeah, you're probably not going to have a better, you know, that's what, is, is that why Jimmy Carter got, in trouble because he said, oh, yeah, by the way, folks, you're, you're going to be the first generation who's going to make less money than your parents. And people didn't want to hear that. So they went with Reagan. But no, I, I think there's so many stories out there. You don't have to be a reporter. You don't have to be a so-called professional like myself to be able to tell those stories, to be able to find the stories of your own family. You just need to have you just need to be curious about things. You need to know how to ask questions. You need to know you need to be uh, fascinated by things. And then you just go from there and Writing, right? Here's the thing. Writing can be taught. Curiosity can't. That's what I've learned. Like you can teach anyone how to write. Well, seriously, I, I again, I, te I teach. I teach at a community college. But the curiosity factor, the hustle factor, that's almost uncrackable. And I know that's not a word, but it should be a word. Well, we're making new words and changing <laughs> new words all the time. So uncrackable. Uh, I mean, I, I probably write a made up word every time. You sprinkle in Spanish all the time in, in what you write. And so you, you'll see like a word and I'm like, well, I don't know that Spanish word. Now I'll look it up. And you're slowly teaching me my, my bad Spanish to be not so <laughs> Spanish. 
Yeah, no, I I don't know. I sometimes I do it purposefully, but honestly, it's just natural. It, it, it's just natural the way I talk. And I'm the child of immigrants. My first language was Spanish, although I was completely fluent in English or for the most part by age seven. But even to this day, I still uh, mispronounce words. I say accept as a sep. I say, I just learned recently that it's scarcer, not scarcer. So I say scarcer. That just, I don't know, that, that was the upbringing that I had. But when it comes to Spanish, I, just with languages, period, I've always been fascinated by languages. I was like, like if I can't, if there's a concept, even though it's not English or Spanish and it's a foreign word, but if it's a concept that I can incorporate into my day-to-day -day life, I'm going to do it. Like I, lo I, I love Yiddish, you know, I, I have a book right here. I'll show it to you right now. The Joy of Yiddish, The Joys of Yiddish. Awesome, legendary book. I haven't read it. I'll be honest with you, but I grew up around enough uh, uh, Jewish culture to know a little bit of Oy Vey and Shlemiel and all that good stuff. And Shlomiel is a little bit different. That's not something you use too much. But oy vey, I say oy vey all the time. I'll be like oy vey, whatnot, you know. Uh, yeah. in, in Arabic, I, I love uh, the term inshallah, you know, God willing. Because we say that also in Spanish. We say ojalá. Ojalá is like hopefully, literally comes from inshallah. So right. I'll say sometimes inshallah. Why not? And if people want to know, don't know what it is, ask me. I'll, I'll explain to you more, more than that. Just be curious about the world because the world that you live in, Okay, it's a cool world, but there's so much more out there. Go out and learn about it because you might be surprised. You might be surprised at, uh, about your beliefs. Maybe your beliefs are actually wrong. Well, they probably are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably all wrong a lot more than we allow. Yeah. Uh, I do love the mixing of languages. Uh, I've, I've spent a lot of time in the Middle East. Uh, I understand a lot of, of Arabic. And I think in particular, inshallah works really well here in Southern California where people say, how far is that? And I'm like, it's not how far, it's how long. And, you know, you know how it is down here. I mean, what? Once every other year, uh, a plane lands on the 405. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a little yeah. small plane. We're not talking about Jumbo Jet, but yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But still, it's just the biggest, free, busiest freeway in the world. And there's a plane on it and it shuts it down or whatever kind of crazy. So you could say, yeah, I'll be there in about 40 minutes. You really could say inshallah because it's really out of your hands because yeah. of the, the size and scope of Southern California. Totally. No, I mean, that's one of the... That's one of the great things about living in Southern California. You don't know, you don't know what's going to happen, except a lot of people are going to complain about it. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I've learned from getting on the road, and again, I, I go a lot. I was out for several weeks during this summer, just meeting people and talking to people is when you, when you go out on the road and you're not watching TV all the time, you meet real people and yeah. they have real problems. They have real joys and, and what they don't talk about, is, uh, you know, like how we see it on the internet and how we see it on TV. What they don't talk about is the political nonsense. It's not nearly as divisive when you talk to people at their face, at their value, where they're at. You understand they've got bigger concerns. Yeah, well, I mean, you got to talk to people, period. Uh, and that's a problem. I, I don't want to, I'm not one of these people who blame technology for it. We're, we've always been in our bubbles. The fact that, I mean, you could have a Catholic, even with the Catholic Church, I'm Catholic and Every parish is going to be different and you're going to have not different beliefs. Nevertheless, although there are different, uh, what do you call them? Not orders, but like there, there's, there's different branches of the Catholic church, but I understand we all want to be in our tribes. We all want to be in our silos. So this is one of the important things of why you do need people talking to each other one way or another. And even online or whatnot, like you still have to make your argument, but you have to come and talk in good faith. You can't come in immediately ridiculing the other side. You have to be able to try to understand where they're coming from. And if if you're not going to agree, well, intelligent minds can disagree about things. I, I've always maintained that. I've always I am, you know, I am a, I am a bomb thrower, especially on social media. But then it's funny because people will actually meet me in person. They're like, oh, you're not the jerk that you come off as in social media. I'm like, look, I'm not going to say it's a persona. It is a part of me. But if you're going to talk to me, if you're going to talk to me in a reasoned manner, then I'm going to uh, respond to you in a reasoned manner. But if you're going to come at me ridiculing me, well, then I'm going to joke around with you and frankly not, you know, not, not treat you. Uh, I don't want to say not treat you with any respect, but treat you with the respect that you're giving me. Um, but that's my job as a reporter. If I was an individual human being, then we're not a human being. I would hope I'm a human being. But if I was just meeting you stranger to stranger, I'm not a reporter or whatnot, some sort of public persona, then I'm going to talk to you completely, completely different. I, mean, I remember a long, long, long time ago, 
I was covering the immigration, the eternal immigration debates in Orange County. And there was a woman who I knew belonged to a rapidly anti-immigrant group, but she just so happened to be in a supermarket and so, like she dropped something and it rolled towards me. And on public, I, you know, if it was on the battlefield of immigration, I wouldn't care. But look, we're in the sh same shopping thing. The decent thing to do is for me to pick up, give it to her. She had no idea who I was. I knew who she was, but there it is. Thank you. Simple as that. Simple as that. I'm not, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna despise the people who I don't agree with to the point where I'm gonna rob them of their humanity. That's just stupid and that's frankly uh murderous. It's also not a very good policy if you want to try to build unity in a community. I mean, at some point, you know, like people I'm a big champion of tolerance. Like I've seen a lot of conflict in, in terrible places and I understand tribalism really, really well. But if if we can't allow someone to learn at their own pace or we, if we can't allow them to be welcomed towards somewhere in the middle where we can have a conversation, you don't have to condone what they do, but you have to accept that that is their reality. You know, someone who's eating out of a dumpster didn't say, ooh, my life goes to eat out of a dumpster. They, they took a path. And there but for the grace of God go you as well. I yeah, mean, yeah. you could have been there. So that tolerance, it's tough. It's tough to be tolerant of things, especially if we don't like them because it's easy to tolerate stuff we like. I, oh, I love yeah. I love quesadillas. I could tolerate that all day long. But it's uh, how do we work on tolerance, man? How do we communicate that? It seems like both of us are visitors from other cultures and we kind of explain them to other people. How do we teach that tolerance? Well, it, it depends on what your role is in society. If you are just, um, thank you, Viking Jerome, who says great series about Fernando yeah. Valenzuela for the other time. Sorry, I was I haven't been seeing the comments. I was just trying to look at you and being as professional as possible oh, just to that. But um, thank you, Viking Jerome. It, it depends. It honestly depends. Like I'm a little bit different. You're a little bit different because we're both, whether you want to call it broadcasters or reporters, we have a venue, we have a soapbox, so to speak. So we can teach a little bit more. We can be a little bit louder, but if you're just in your private world, I mean, challenge yourself to go do things that you don't like. I mean, as a reader, this is what I do. And I would do this also as well. Even if I was a reporter, I read stuff I don't agree with all the time. So I subscribe to at least 400 newsletters, a lot. Everything from extreme left, straight up socialism, like Jacobin or Jacobin Magazine, however the hell you pronounce it, yeah. to, you know, more conservative stuff. Uh, I, I'm big into religion, so I'll read, like, on the, on the Catholic bet, for instance, uh, I'll read the National Catholic Reporter, which is a liberal publication, America, which is a Jesuit publication, Commonweal, which is a leftist publication, but then I'll swing over to the right. I'll get First Things, which is a very, you know, Orthodox Catholic, uh, New Orthodox Review, which is very Orthodox Catholic. And I don't agree with everything that any side says. I would be more on the left side of the spectrum, but I'm still Catholic. And so I challenge myself. And I think by challenging yourself, you'll be able to understand why people believe the things they do, talk the way they talk, do the things they do. And then that equips you then to, if you're in a position where you're, you're not as comfortable as you want to be, well, okay, you're still there. Well, you're going to cry. You're going to start punching people. No, that's, that's what children do. I think too much of America, we're, we're a juvenile society. We need to start acting like adults and adults talk it out. Adult, well, the adults also fight, but ideal adults, we talk it out. We agree to disagree. And then we either go on or, or, you know, you, you just deal with it. Like I did a story about um, it, there was wildfires in Southern California. I mean, there's always wildfires, but yeah. last year it was right. on the other side, like where the Antelope Valley is, where it was physically Juniper Hills. So I did a story about a Latino family who had bought their dream home there, their acres like 20 years ago. And they were afraid that it was completely burned out, but then it turned out that it was everything was fine. So I drove up there and they just told me like, yeah, when we were coming up here, it was like bonanza country. It was all older white folks, gnarled, you know, burnt by the sun and whatnot, super conservative. And they're not super liberal, but they're far from more liberal. And slowly but surely, you're getting more Latino families out there. So the guy was telling me, the patriarch of the family, how his neighbor is a Trump supporter who every once in a while flies a Confederate flag. And of course, the Mexican family doesn't like that at all, but they're neighbors. So when it snows, you have to, you know, you have to clear out the road. What, you're going to clear out the road by yourself? Either one? No, you're going to tell your neighbor who you might not agree with, but like, hey, neighbor, we got this uh, shared problem together. Let's get together. Let's talk and make it happen like that. And I just thought that was, and it's funny because 
some people on the left are like, oh, well, that, that guy's a sellout. The Mexican's a sellout. I'm like, you're not in that same position. You are you're actually speaking from a position of privilege when you say, screw that other person, because you're not the neighbor caught in the snowstorm asking for help from your other neighbor who you might not agree with politically. That's what being an adult is. At least that's what my parents taught me about, about adulthood, you know? Yeah, well, and you remind me of that uh, column that was in the, I think it was LA Times, where that lady who lived probably in the valley somewhere was complaining because her conservative neighbor shoveled the snow from her big bear house. <laughs> oh, no. I, 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 maybe it was the Times. It wasn't my column, though. But yeah, like, come on. Like, it wasn't your column, but it was, it was in, it was, you know, there. And, and then she wrote this thing, and it's like, how big of an asshole are you? You know, someone just, your neighbor just did you a solid, and you, you're not even there. Yeah. And you criticize. And look, this this story happens to have a person who's left leaning, who's the asshole. It goes the other direction yeah, for yeah. sure. But my, my, yeah, my, times. my issue with partisanship is when you have apologists. So mm. everything that you criticize the other side of doing, your side has done. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And if you try to say your side is pure and your 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 side is righteous, then there's a difference between being right and being righteous. You could be right. right on an issue. But being none of us are righteous, are any yeah. of that. Like the cancel culture coming from the left, the right was doing it as well. But the left has also done it as well. So, but when you point those things out, like that, that to me is the marker of a true, again, a true adult. It's like, are you willing to call out, you know, it's what Jesus said. Are you, you know, what, what is it? Like pull out the pole in your eye instead of calling out the smoke or whatever it is and your, your enemy's eye. Like, come on, like you, you have to call yourself out first. If you could do that, and very few people do that, by the way, but if you could do that, then I'm going to have more respect for whatever your position is going to be. And I'm going to give you a little bit more authority than someone who's not going to be able to will, who's not willing to call out the rot in their own side or in, or in, in their own tribe, so to speak. You know, it's funny getting out of the state, you see a lot of different things uh, here in California. I think I can say this in, as a general term, we're very dismissive and disdainful of the South. But oh, the yeah. moment, you, moment you leave California, California is the South for a lot of <laughs> nation. They think we're crazy here. Oh yeah. No, no. I, I, I've been traveling to the South before COVID, but my wife and I, every year we would take a road trip to, uh, Central Kentucky and Tennessee, because there's something there called the world's longest yard sale, which is imagine a gigantic flea market with amazing stuff and super cheap at that. So we have been doing it since 2007. And so we when you know, and I, of course, I knew what I was getting to because uh, when I the before I got into the South anyways, um, especially in the rural parts, because my parents are like, I would say they're Mexican hillbillies. So I know how rural folks are. I know that mentality, whether you're Mexican or you know, Appalachian, I know that mentality. And so going in there, I've always had a blast. I've never felt discriminated against. The only times I've ever felt discriminated uh, discriminated against in the South, frankly, are in the big cities. In the big cities, that's where I have felt, we have been discriminated against. But in these small towns, like, no. And, and then they would see our California license plates and they're more like, oh, that's funny. Like, what on earth are you folks doing here? You know, their <laughs> accent. But they were immediately saying, oh, you know, liberal California or whatnot, because they saw us, at, you know, we, we were customers there. So, of course, they weren't going to just dismiss us. And, and they were not going to dismiss us also because my, you know, both my wife and I are Mexicans. But it was that license plate. And we told them, like, oh, we've been doing this all the time. And we chill. Like, yeah, you know, this is not like, oh. So, in their mind, we were okay because we came to their home and we're not dismissing them as a bunch of rednecks and hillbillies because we're talking to them as humans and vice versa. It's like, okay, you Southerners, you're, you're all right. Like. Maybe if we talked a little bit more, we'd find things to disagree on. But for right now, we have not even a truce. We're accepting each other. We're friendly. And that that is a big step. But again, people like to stay in their bubbles. And when they stay in their bubbles, that's when, if you stay in your bubble for too long, that's when you become stupid. And guys like us, we're people that, so as a, a term I use called, called miscomfort, right? Where huh. you are unfamiliar with it, you know, and you get it. The prefix is weird, but but this is the point. Is oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's clever, actually, possible. yeah. Yeah, and you and I will pop into someone else's bubble and we can handle the, oh, this is a bit weird in here, you know? Uh, <laughs> but but we come back with these stories. This is what I did when I was in the military working in Iraq, Afghanistan, all these places. I would take the reality of the Afghans and then the reality of the army or the state, whoever it was I was working for, and I would share them to each other to kind of balance the equation, you know? Mm. And, and you do a similar thing where you're like, hey, these things are actually normal, beautiful, and wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, no, for me, it's like, 
there's nothing new under the sun to quote Ecclesiastes, my favorite book yeah. in the Bible. Um, but there, there's always commonalities. You just have to look for them. I mean, I talked about it earlier. Ojalá and inshallah. Like, and a lot of times we don't know that because again, we are we stay in our bubble, and it's a human, uh, it's a human tendency to do so. And so that's fine. It's okay to stay in your. It's okay to be in your bubble. It's not okay to only want to stay there, not challenge yourself to get out of that bubble. That's where I would say that because we, we all uh, we're humans. We want to be in comfortable areas. You don't want to be in discomfort. Most people don't want to be in discomfort, but challenge yourself to try to do that every once in a while. But yeah, and you can move by being in discomfort. You can become comfortable in that state. <laughs> it's not. It's not discomfort. It's just an unfamiliar uh, kind liminal of liminal space. Yes, yeah, exactly. Liminality. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I again. I, even if I was a reporter, I'd be that. But for me, I'm just a curious person. I want to know how, you know, uh, the, that cliche, how the other side lives. I want to see what's going yeah. on. I want to, uh, you know, I'm curious about things. That's why I do read stuff that I don't agree with. Like, why, what are you, why are you thinking the way you're thinking? And again, like, if I am convinced, if I'm convinced out of my position, well, then, okay, I'm convinced out of my position. Or maybe I still stay my position, but now I know what the other side thinks about my position. That just makes my argument stronger. I, I, I don't know why more people, well, I say, I don't know why more people want to, don't want to do that. But then I realize we're talking about you. So there you go. <laughs> Southern California is a crazy place. And LA County is significantly different than say Santa Barbara County, which is different than San Bernardino County, which is vastly different than Orange County, you know, on and on and on. But we are a collective. How do you define what Southern California is? Oh boy! Uh, geographically, I would say Ventura County to Riverside County, and then Ventura County, LA County, Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino. I would exclude San Diego County just because it's a little bit different, and then Santa Barbara County. That's when you start going into the Central Coast. But if you're talking about a mindset, what is a Southern California mindset? Well, it's a place that does love the good life. It's a place that I think forgets how good the life is. And also, though, a place where we do not, where we are in our silos and we are in our, bu our bubbles and we do have different experiences of what that good life is. And, and also a place, you know, not, you know, where you have had, uh, it's a history where you have had a lot of discrimination. I, and I would extend this more to California. I'm like, California is such a racist state that we even, try to keep white people out known as the Okies. Like, and it was LA County yeah. Sheriff that set up, what would they call bum, big bum brigades out of outside of Barstow to make sure that Okies and Arkies that folks from Texas weren't coming over during the great depression. So there's a paranoia as far as much as we try to pretend that there is uh, that we're all laid back in Southern California. There's a paranoia that messes with us and sometimes does explode in anger. From the desert to the sea to all of Southern California, says Brad Hutchings. That's Jerry Dunphy, of course. But yeah, like you have that mentality. So and I think, you know, and also Southern California is a place that, is, that has a lot of history. But too many of us are, uh, try to remain a historical because we're trying to read, you know, a lot, we get a lot of newcomers in. We, you know, it's it's hard to find people that are like fifth or sixth, like people going further back than, say, uh, let's say like their great great grandparents. Because you'll have people for generations, but uh, you, you, we forget, like up until the early 1900s, L.A. County was still a backwater, rural backwater. L.A. doesn't really start becoming a city until around the World War One era. Then, of course, explodes. What we know now as Southern California doesn't start until World War uh, after World War Two. Americans and then the rest of the world comes in. So this is still a, this is still an area that we're not like New York or Boston or like other cities or even say Tucson or uh, El Paso that have that set mindset of this is who we are. We're still trying to figure out who we are. Yeah. It's interesting. By the way, my, my big complaint about Tucson, I love it. It's a gorgeous area. <laughs> Everything south of, of Tucson is great, but they are in desperate need of a traffic loop around that place. <laughs> it's an hour from the 10 to get up to the mountains or whatever. Yeah, uh, totally. Yeah. It's interesting when, when you, when you talk in these regards, like the, the, the racist history of, of who we are, but yes, we're also very tolerant. I mean, we, I think we struggle in one area where as Americans, we look at problems literally as, as ethnically black or white. And then, and now we, oh, and, and other, you know, like to say Latino or people of color, 
you can't tell me that a Colombian, a Puerto Rican, a Mexican are all the same people. They're vastly different, just like someone from Kentucky and Washington State and Arizona are dramatically different. But we try to package people into these simple groups, and it's just not possible. No, it's not. But again, it's the human condition. We want to make things as simple as possible. So in our mind, oh, you speak all Spanish? Well, you all have to be the same way, one way or another, right? I think that's where uh, Latinos have thrown this monkey wrench. And before that, I was like, oh, you're black or you're white. And let's not forget, like, what, what, who are, quote unquote, white people? Yeah. This is a big melting pot of all of Europe. And you had to become white. Like when, like, you know, I have another book somewhere. Because I like showing off books just because I'm a nerd that way. Yeah. Where on earth did I leave you? Okay, I do not. They're hidden behind me. But I've always been fascinated by the ethnic history of the United States. So there was a series during the 1970s where it collected the history, the the history of racism towards Jews, Chinese, Mm. and Italians. And the titles of these books, WAP, Chink, and Kike. Right. Oh, yeah. No. And so with the Italians, now we think Italian Americans, oh, so American. No, no, no. Some of the nastiest, because I, I don't collect it, but I do read it. Some of the nastiest cartoons ever drawn about people. There's one notorious one of Italians swimming from Ellis Island off the shore to trying to get into the United States. And these Italians are, are rats. They're literally rats with big mustaches with a dagger on their mouth and whatnot. Like nasty, nasty stuff. I mean, this is almost at the same caricatures as, um, you know, as the caricatures of black people, except black people weren't being drawn as rats. It, Irish, Thomas Nast, the legendary political cartoonist, despised the Irish and drew them as freaking gorillas, as, as gorillas. You're as stupid as an ape. And I think we forget about that history so much. And, all, and also, I would say white people forget that history, that your ancestors, two to three generations ago, they were not considered white. You were able to assimilate because that's the American way to be able to assimilate into this particular place. But in the United States, like we don't teach, this is why I'm a proponent proponent of ethnic studies. I do not believe in, eth- I do not believe in ethnic studies to teach, especially uh, students of color that they're victims and white students that they're the enemy. I don't believe that at all. And I think if you do teach that, that again, that's a historical, but I do think it's important to teach our students the complete history of the United States. It's not as pretty. And I get it, you know, different things for different grades. But once you start getting to high school, you should know like, hey, this country is pretty messed up. This country is still the greatest country on earth, but it's still pretty messed up. And this is the history behind it. And I think if you make, if you draw out that history, it'll connect folks to each other more. It's like, wow, despite all this crap, well, here we are with our iPhones and we're able to make something of ourselves. This country isn't perfect by any sense of the imagination, but this is an experiment where all of us, one way or another, are trying to make something better. And sometimes, sadly, there's other people who are going to try to clamp down on the other folks. But the other folks still have been able to get ahead one way or another, you know, or are trying to, trying to. I, I think to me, the, the American experiment is an American of co- constant struggle. And when we do become complacent in what we're doing, that's where the problems start happening. One of the things I love about America is that it, it is we're built to be like in a rolling gunfight all the time. <laughs> You know, like hopefully without the actual ammunition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm talking to verbal gunfire, but like we're not going to agree politically quite often. We're we're going to fight because everybody has a chance to say something, which means that everybody's going to fight. And so we have this this diversity plus unity thing. And right now we're struggling with the unity part, but because we allow some look, look at the problems that we're trying to tackle. We're trying to tackle multi sexual orientation, multi genderism as as a topic. Go. A thousand miles to the south, I promise that's not going to be a friendly conversation. I mean, it's just it's not. So we're handling these very complex issues in a way that that we're able to slowly advance and slowly understand these things in our lifetimes. Uh, the way people refer to people who are homosexual, yeah, is dramatically different. Dr- oh, I mean, yeah. it's it went from being mocked openly by all of us to being accepted and embraced. Yeah, yeah, to, to a, yeah, to to a certain extent, but yeah, again. It is a work in progress and it is a work in progress. That's never going to be finished, nor should it be finished. Frankly, I think once you get to, <laughs> I mean, look at the Israelites. Once they got out of Egypt, they, God got mad at them because they got complacent. And so they had to spend 40 years in the desert and none of them, none of that generation were able to go into the Holy land. So like you should yeah. always be struggling to get to a better place with 
when by realizing and, and realizing that you yourself are not going to get to that better place, but the hope is that your children and the folks after you will get to a better place. One of the things that's interesting too is if you start reading books and start diving in, we all start to understand like, wow, there's so much that I don't understand about this and, and synthesizing different histories, like the impact of Islamic and and Arab culture on, say, Mexican culture, you know, and how the kind of words you say. I mean, there's literally like Shakira is claimed by everybody, you know, because she's just so uh, multi-ethnic. And, yeah. and it's interesting that we have these things. It, you know, and that's brushed up against your comment earlier about ethnic studies. I, I went to what was Hayward State and now it's Cal State East Bay. Yeah. But um, they had an ethnic studies program and I looked through it and I was shocked at how non-inclusive it was. Mm. It was very specific to very specific groups. And if you want to understand the Swedish heritage and how people immigrated from there or from Germany or from Ireland or for it Italy and all these different struggles, you couldn't find those classes in this entire degree program. Yeah, I, w I would say, though, that because you don't have that significant Swedish American population in the Bay Area, on the other hand, you go up to, say, Minnesota, North Dakota, I guarantee you, you will have those. You will have, I apologize for my dog here. Um, you right. will have those types of classes. And this is why I, I think for some place like California, like I'll give you an example, Cosmo. For a place like California, you know, the Swedish experience, honestly, you're stuck with like Kingsburg, California, which is in, in, in the Central Valley for like big. And, you know, not to say that there's not Swedish stuff, but if we talk about yeah. who are the big white ethnic groups that have dominated what we now are, quote unquote, white ethnic groups that we uh, have influenced what we now know as California, I would say you, you should know about the Okies. You should know about the Armenians. You should know probably, I mean, statewide in terms of big, huge things um, in the Bay Area, Italians, of course, big, huge in the in in Los Angeles County. That's where you have Greeks. You have uh, Croatians, especially in San Pedro. Like they ran a lot of those canneries again. Like and, and this is the thing, though, this is the, the 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 problem when we stare when we stay in our silos, you talk to a lot of proponents of ethnic studies. They don't know those distinct right. histories they don't know those distinct communities because they can't possibly imagine that those communities had any issues because they mm -hmm. thought they were white but then at the same time those own communities they think oh well the only people that care about this is us so we, they don't try to do a job to try to incorporate their stories more you did have a little bit of that with the debate over at what's now the ethnic studies bill you had jewish groups trying to push a little bit back more on like be more inclusive of their history, Armenians as well. And I like that. I'm like, yeah, we want more of that history. There should be more of that history. Students should know that this is California. It is a whole bunch of stuff to reduce quote unquote white people to being white. It does a disservice to, it does a disservice to us, frankly. Yeah. And then, you know, again, back to that question of what is white, I was at a funeral this week for a guy who was an icon in the skating community. And the guy who was emceeing it is he's Armenian. Yeah. And if you looked at him, you'd be like, that guy's not white, you know? uh -huh. <laughs> but he is. And in that fact, he's Caucasian, truly, you know, I mean, yeah, his, true. Like, yeah. his ethnicity and, but we don't consider that. And so here's this guy that's clearly not Anglo-Saxon, which is code for white. Yeah. But, you know, he's excluded from that. Egyptians, technically, academically white. You know, there's all kinds of people that fall into that Caucasian category who are nowhere near the Caucasus regions. We struggle to identify what is and what isn't white. And if I was to show an array of people from every country, like a prototypical European person, Maltese, Turkish, whatever, and I said, pick out the white people, you wouldn't point to all of that and say, that's white people. Yeah. So we're really bad at that. Oh, yeah. On the other hand, my mom was super, super white, whiter than you, whiter than most yeah. white people you ever meet. And she was Mexican. And, yeah. that white, and that white skin, by the way, didn't stop her from being a, being discriminated against when she yeah. was in school and in, in the United States in the 1960s. So I, I this the, the problem with this country, we've had for far too long an obsession with race. And it's not of recent vintage where I think we should have more of an obsession with class. But you can't talk about class because that makes you a socialist. Yeah. 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 <laughs> You're right about that. And class is a problem. Oh, it's a huge and, problem. And, and we ignore ethnicity. We also fall a little bit in love, a lot in love. We uh, beatify the native people and and we really know very little about them we just know that they were here before us but who was they're here still here them? yeah right they're still uh -huh. here you talk to historians that know that stuff and it's like you have to understand how much these these ethnicities and these people washed over each other eliminated each other and so 
our knowledge, our grasp goes back. How far does our, the average grasp of a California go back on our history? Is it 50 years? Is it, is it even that? It's certainly not 200 years. No, I mean, the, you know, generally there was missions and that California was part of Mexico. And then there was Disney, then there was Hollywood. And then that's about it. Then it goes forward from there. But that, that's that's the American way, though, unless you do come from like like Yankee stock. And I'm talking about you can trace your heritage back to, you know, John Winthrop and all those people or you're a southerner and, you you know, you know what your roots are. And that's still a significant part of the United States. But also, you know, the, the people just forget that history. People forget that history and people only know that history. and They don't know the history of other regions. Also, I mean, uh, Americans, we love to forget. We love to forget. We we like to we love to forget. We think our problems are new. Again, there's nothing new under the sun, though. And the sooner we as Americans realize that, the better we could be off. And I'm not just talking about like I know there's a bunch of alarmism about what's going on now. But again, I take the long view. I'm like, you think you think the rhetoric is nasty now? Like go back to just. 1980s, 1960s, 1940s, uh, you know, all the trash that they used to talk about FDR and the New Deal, and they wouldn't call it the New Deal, um, uh, you know, the the neo-Nazis uh, talk about freaking, there was a, the, what was it, the, the Bund, the Bund, the, 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 the apologist for, the, for Hitler filling up Madison Square Garden, You're, you know, you could cry all you want about Charlottesville and what happened in Charlottesville was bad, but that wasn't Madison Square Garden. Um, yeah. There's nothing new under the sun. What happened at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th, that was pretty interesting. But again, this is not, none of this is unprecedented. Uh, we just have to realize that the sooner we realize that, the better we could move forward with whatever we need to move forward with in terms of bettering this country. Yeah, there was just an actual coup the other day, an actual coup in Sudan. I mean, that, not yeah, like yeah. A, not just uh, something that could be coup like, and I'm not making light of January, sure, sure. but it, but this is an actual thing. <laughs> We're like perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just a big thing, man. Perspective is huge. Like we talk about the one percent, and I always say scope the camera back, because I can poop in my toilet, not to be you know crude or anything, <laughs> and that disappears with fresh water. Yeah, you know, like how decadent is that? I can I can turn my faucet on when I brush my teeth and leave the water running for two and a half minutes while I brush my teeth with my electric toothbrusher, you know, and it never occurs to me just how incredibly fortunate we are here in this nation. We are. No, we, we totally are. I do think again, just, I don't know. I, if I were a billionaire like Elon Musk or anyone at a certain point, I'm like, do you really need that money? And most of these people do because they create these humongous lifestyles for themselves that has to subsidize yeah. all of that. But I don't know. I, I, I don't think money's evil, but money can certainly corrupt people very fast. And I think yeah. that the best, the, you know, the, the, the ideal life, at least the life that I try to live. I, I like living a comfortable life for sure, but I don't need to have all this money and I need to have enough to be able to sustain. I mean, you see what's around me. My comfortable life is books, but these are not new books. These are all used books that I bought over my lifetime. And then if I could use that money to help folks and not just by mm. writing a check, I think more people should do that. People say like, like recently you've been seeing all the, you know, the HBO HBO show Succession is on and uh, the mainstream media loves to talk about, oh yeah, it's a parody of the Murdoch. So now you're having the backlash from the conservative faction, people saying, well, you know, they try to make all rich people out to be like evil, but like all the rich people that I know, they're all involved in charity. They're all nice yeah. people. And it's like, okay, fine. Rockefeller gave a lot of money to a lot of people. He was also, he killed a bunch of his strikers. So that's not, again, I, I, I think for me, yeah, I don't romanticize anything. You have to be as clear minded about things, romanticizing nostalgia. I just think they're Achilles heels that will set you up for misery and uh, anger and, yeah. and cloud your judgment of what's in front of you. Yeah. Nostalgia is an intoxicant and it becomes poisonous yeah. real fast. It, it really does. No, no, I totally. want to your wife's uh, restaurant slash market in downtown Santa Ana on 4th Street. I've been there. It's fantastic. Oh, thank you. you guys are Orange County folks. If you're destination folks, come in Orange County. Go to Al Alta Baja. You'll love it. It's so it's so damn cool. I want to go back and buy Christmas <laughs> gifts there, which I am going to do. And I, I appreciate it. I wanted to ask you, because you do have Catholic roots. Uh, I grew up in a town that was the, uh, the first official state capitol building is Benicia. Mm. And we have one of the oldest churches. Yeah. West, if not the oldest church, is west of, of something. We'll say the Mississippi. I don't remember uh -huh. the exact thing, but no, because yeah. you have New Mexico. So New Mexico right, goes right, back right. to sixteen hundreds. So we'll say west of the Sierras or whatever it is, right? Yeah. But it's the oldest churches. It's been around for over one hundred and fifty years. 
but we're also becoming as a people less dependent upon the church, less dependent upon that kind of and and dismissive of the Catholic faith because you know there's there's a lot of problems at, with the institution. But it is California. I mean, we got this El Camino Real that runs the length of the joint with missions all up along it. What are you thinking? Like, how do we deal with this complex problem of the Catholic Church, but also the Catholic influence on our history and who we are? Well, it's part. It's who we are. You can knock down statues of Junipero Serra all you want. You could call the missionaries, all the all the Franciscans, colonizers and genociders and all that, but it's still our history. Again, I I think we need to learn that. We need to learn. We need to tell the full recounting of it. You can't just romanticize like, oh, you know, the way you were taught, you and I were taught uh, in the school system. Oh, yeah, the missionaries came. The Indians were dumb. The missionaries took care of them. Here, build a bunch of missions with sugar cubes or however you want to do so. No, you got to tell the, I mean, you got to tell the truth. Look, here are the missionaries. True, the, what's up? <laughs> That's all true. Yeah, it's all true. Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating at all. You say the missionaries came, their job uh, was yeah. they wanted to evangelize these, uh, th- these Native Americans and Native, some of them, a lot of the Native Americans, they went to that, but because of diseases and outbreaks that brought on by the Spaniards, a lot of them died. A lot of them were basically indentured servants. And here's the recount. And all, all of that, by the way, is in the official accounts of the missionaries of all that. Teach the full history. But say, like, we're in a better place now. We are in a better place. We have moved on. Don't eliminate that history. The minute you start eliminating history or trying to eliminate history, it's going to yeah. come back to screw you later on. So that's a historical perspective on the, I mean, on what's going on right now. Again, going back to like just ap- ap- an apologist. And hypocrites, frankly. So I did a lot of work early in my career on the Catholic Church sex abuse scandal. It was happening in the Diocese of Warren. So here you had uh, bishops, cardinals, Cardinal Mahoney in Los Angeles, knowing that their priests um, abused. No, like it is not a question of whether it happened. They knew that their priests were abusers. And instead of turning them over to law enforcement, they would just shuffle them off to into poorer parishes, which means in Southern California, more Latino parishes or, or, or more black parishes. And then when that didn't work, you just send them into like Native American areas or the South Pacific or um, Mexico or Latin America or whatnot. I covered a lot of this. And the conservative Catholics at the time, they just said, oh no, it's a bunch of lies, a bunch of lies, a bunch of lies, a bunch of lies, and just then moved on. Then And this is all, by the way, this all went back to John Paul II, who's now a saint. He knew what was going on, but you make apologies. So flash forward to the current Pope, Pope Francis, and then you had the scandal with uh, Cardinal McCarrick from uh, Washington, who turned out had um, sexually violated semina- young seminarians you know, decades ago, but nevertheless happened. Oh, all of a sudden, Pope Francis is covering up uh, sex abuse and covering up, you know, he's he's a pedophile protector and all that. No, 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 no. It, it just, it, it angers me. And of course, and actually, again, it's because I read a whole bunch of stuff. New Orthodox Review, which I actually, it's a very thought provoking publication because uh, the guy's a total Orthodox Catholic, but he just wrote uh, Peter Vries. He's actually based out of Berkeley, of all places. But um, but he, was it him or I think it was him, but just, or maybe it was somebody else, but just talking about like, okay, yeah, the, like he doesn't like the liberals, but he also doesn't like the, he, what he doesn't like about the Orthodox Catholics is that. The holiness, the righteousness, that we're the ones who are doing it the right way. These other yeah. people are angry. It's like, no, like Christ says, like, if you're going, like, he is not here to preach to the saved. He's here to pray, to to preach and try to save the people who are not saved, the heathen, so to speak. So you do that outreach out there and you don't, and you don't see that with, with, with the Orthodox population. So I, myself, I only go to the Catholic church now for uh, funerals and not even weddings, just because I I was disillusioned with what happened in Orange County, but I, so I say my, my expression of Catholicism now is through the Catholic worker here in Orange County. We do have a Catholic worker. They're literally doing the Lord's work, helping out unhoused women it, right down the street from, uh, from my wife's door, actually. So I, you know, I, 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 I don't know. I, the the hypocr- hypocrisy is what gets me, but I always say like, even if you're not a person of the faith, that's fine. I'm not going to like yeah. hound you to do that, but, the 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 institution itself still needs to be cleaned out you need hercules cleaning out the asian stables or however the hell you pronounce that word and it just 
clear out all of that filth because yeah. it's still there. So final final topic, and I, I want to get into this because we talked about all this like societal and cross cultural things and everything else. But I think we both have a default of working and just yeah. <laughs> work your way through because no one gets an easy path, right? Yeah. Even if you're super wealthy and entitled, there's always no one wants anybody else's problems. But if you just put your head down and get to work, you're likely going to be able to accomplish pretty much whatever you want in this country for most people. I mean, it's really remarkable. So talk about working and the value of it. Well, you have to work. I mean, nothing's handed to you in life. Nothing is. And if it's handed to you, well, you're that's good for you. Congrats. But that's one thing. Not everything. Your entire life is not going to be handed to you. You'll, sometimes you'll get opportunities. Take them. I've gotten opportunities in my life. I've taken them. But then, okay, once you're in that opportunity, then what are you going to do? You still have to work. You still have to go out there and get that stuff. This is the work ethic that my parents taught me. My dad was a truck driver, short haul. My mom was a tomato canner. Uh, both of them had, my mom dropped out of school in ninth grade in the United States. My dad dropped out of school in fourth grade in Mexico. All we had is our work, our work. And I just, I, I wrote about it in my newsletter this week, actually, this idea of when I was an editor, I would interview students who wanted to be interns and I would ask them a simple question. What's the value of hard work? And most of them answer, you know, they would try to, they weren't expecting it because it seems like such a childish answer, but I'm like, or a childish question, but I just want to, by the response, I would know, okay, is this a good person or that person? I remember there was one guy who was completely cock and he wasn't going to get the, inter, the inner, what do you call it? The internship anyway, but I'm like, I'm just going to go through with this. So then I told them what's the value of hard work. And he kind of giggled nervously. He's like, well, it's not about working hard. It's about working smart. I'm like, and I told him like, no, it's never about working smart. You still have to work hard. Working hard is working smart. If you think you could like Google your way out of life, then it's not going to happen. And I don't need you. And so that person uh, did not, and, you know, I don't see him in journalism anywhere because uh, his working smart caught up to him and he wasn't working smart at all. Yeah. I really love the uh, contrast between the Ruth Bader Ginsburg documentary and the one for Clarence Thomas. And what you oh. see, both of these people are just remarkable up their upbringings. Clarence Thomas's grandfather just absolutely is, is like, you're like, yeah, don't let the sun once. catch you. Yeah. Slip up once and you're out of the house. And, and so you have this guy who's like, I realized as a black guy in the South, I didn't have to get A's. I had to be perfect. I had to beat these people badly, you know, and here's this guy that has done it. Yeah, we despise him. A lot of people despise yeah. this guy. And it's just remarkable when you see like adoration and just complete rejection. But here is a guy that worked through significant adversity, but yeah. more than most people will have now. But um, I don't know. I, it's just I struggle with trying to understand how we balance these things out. And then I realize, why don't I quit worrying about that and just get back to work? You know, <laughs> you could admire people's uh, you know, story and Clarence Thomas's story coming out of what he experienced was remarkable. My issue with Thomas, besides his besides his uh, political beliefs, is just, you know, this is a man who was a, uh, you know, a recipient of affirmative action. He got to where he was at. At least he, he got the breaks. He got the breaks. Again, going back to what I said, like, yeah. you're, you could be given opportunities, but then what are you going to do with them? No one's going to pave the entire way for you. So he got that break, and then he made what he did. And so for him to say years later, oh, you know, it makes you feel in fear or whatnot. No, it made you feel in fear, Clarence. It did a, it. You cannot say the same thing about other folks. And then you cannot, once you have this, these positions of power, try to eradicate the very thing. For me, it's hypocrisy. It gets to the question of like, for instance, illegal immigration. People will be like, oh, you really can't want 5 billion Chinese to try to come into the United States. And I tell them, look. My dad came to this country in the trunk of a Chevy in 1968. I am a beneficiary of an illegal immigrant coming yeah. into this country. So, so many, a lot of my family members from my dad's side, at least a lot of my friends, they came in here. I have seen some, you know, some of the hardest working Americans I know are still undocumented. Some of the most lazy, entitled, selfish, oh loser Americans are like Americans four or five generations who don't even know their roots anymore. So for me to say like, oh, we need to stop, we need to put a stop to illegal immigration. I would seem to, I could not live with myself because I would be hypocritical because, right. and people could call me irrational. That's fine. That's fine. But it's not, it's just not going to happen because people say like, oh, we need talented folks. I'm like, my dad wasn't talented. He was, he was a fourth grade cattle farmer when he, uh, he came over to this country when he was 18 years old and look at his four children. Three of us, three of us have advanced degrees and one of us has a bachelor's degree. And 
We all made it happen. This this is what yeah. illegal immigration brought you. I mean, but when my dad was in this country, what did he do? He worked. He pushed himself through working yeah. class, but in an era where you can buy a home with a working class salary. But he made it happen. And my dad was not perfect at all. He was an alcoholic. He's been sober for 36 years. And he's not a perfect man in any sense of definition. But he never once missed, um, what do you call it in English? Uh Mortgage payment. He never once missed a mortgage payment, never once missed a car payment, always had insurance. All Once he became an American citizen, he's voted in every single election since, I think, 98 is when he became a citizen. He's made it happen. He has absolutely made it happen. So that's where I do. <laughs> I, I'll say this on Twitter, but it's like, uh, what's his name? Monset, I, uh, the, the Undertaker, the yeah. very beginning of the Godfather film. One of yeah. my favorite openings of all time. My, one of my favorite opening lines. And I always only remember the very first one. And I'm yeah. going to be totally stereotypical, but whatever. It's like, I believe in America. And the camera slowly pulls yeah. back. But it's like, and you know, the, the Godfather, it is, a, it is a critique of the American way and just how it gets subverted by people trying to get, like, who get the wrong messages about America. And they think it's just whatever it takes to get to the top. That's what the mafia is. And that's not what America at its best is but still this idea like i believe in america i really do believe in america in this america for all of its faults still has a lot of promises and the best you know the, the one gospel we should all believe in is the gospel of work i love it the gospel of work and then i'll, I'll just say this in general let's close out my side of it uh, i believe in immigration too if someone wants to leave their motherland and travel and have a very limited amount of anything, if anything, and they want to take a bet on us, well, come on, let's go. Yeah, if you're going to freaking travel through, I mean, look at the Haitians. Haitians oh my God. went to Chile, lived there a couple of years, went through the jungle, the Darien Gap, one of the most dangerous areas in the world, went all the way through Mexico just to end up in the border. I'm like, you traveled thousands of miles on foot. I want to give you a chance. I, I, I do believe, you know, I'm not one of the, I like my restriction, if you will, on immigration is like, I do believe we need to have a secure border in the sense that we need to know who is coming through. I do believe that. But I, for me, yeah. it's like, my questions are simple. Like, all right, you want to come in? Cool. What's your background? Okay. If you have, you know, terrorists or whatnot, then not. But yeah. like, if you want to make something yourself, all right, here's your chance. Go out and do it. Um, yeah. If you're not going to make a chance out of yourself, then we need to talk. But at the same time, like, you know, again, I, I want people who are going to be productive Americans. And yeah. people say like, well, you don't know that. Well, I'm like, then there's a lot of millions, tens of millions of Americans that we should be supporting right yeah. now. Yeah. America so compelling. The second generation is going to be way more American. Than <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but no one ever wants to talk about that. <laughs> All right. Let me, let me wrap this thing up. Stand by for one second. 